All righty, guys. Welcome to the Hills to Ripples podcast, season one, episode five. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, everything that you're going to need to know from four of our standpoints for beginner hunters. And um, as well as you're going to get to kind of know a couple of us here, Lane and Jameson. So I'll let everyone uh, introduce themselves and just do a quick little intro like always, and then we'll start getting after it. Jamo, take it away. All righty. Um, well, for those of you that don't know, I'm Jameson, uh, part of the Harness Adrenaline Corps. Um, kind of a little bit of background on me is uh, met Charles in college back in the day, and then I took off for the Army, um, was there for a little while, um, and college is kind of when I first started getting into hunting uh, growing up. I didn't do a whole lot of it. Um, didn't have anybody to really take me out. So I did, uh, I tried going out with some of my mom's friends from work. Um, first hunt ever was a goose hunt, but they took a, you know, a 12 year old kid out for a goose hunt where they told him to sit still. So, uh, that didn't work very well for me. Um, got a little bored and, and then it just never kind of blossomed from there. i uh, never had anybody to really show me the way, um, Met some really good people in college, to include Charles, um, and the the group that I met there is where my love for the sport of hunting really blossomed. Um, I'd always been an outdoorsman, but it was mainly hiking and fishing and camping and stuff like that. Um, so like I said, left for the Army, uh, came back, and um, upon returning from the Army, I actually picked up a job um, guiding and mentoring um, novice hunters and youth, and I take out disabled vets uh, twice a year. So that's just a little bit about me and kind of where I'm at. That's fantastic. Yeah, so I'm Lane. Um, I grew up in Montana, um, started hunting when I was younger. Uh, my grandfather paid for my first hunter's education course and went out hunting with my dad my first year ever and got my first ever deer. Um, that was awesome. And then I met Charles when I was in college and Nick through Charles back in about 2020 during COVID. And when Charles was all like, dude, you got to try out archery hunting. And I was like, I don't really know. He's all like, dude, you fly fish. You got to try this. Like, okay, whatever you say. I don't know if I like this and fell in love with it, but I currently teach and and working towards my doctorate in education. So that takes up part of my time. And then in the rest of my free time, I'm either out golfing or mountain biking with some friends of mine or getting out hiking with my lovely girlfriend. And she's interested in going out shed hunting. So Nick will have to hit you up because she's interested. So, Oh, most definitely. we got plenty of spots for you guys to check out. Yeah, she, she's interested, so we'll see how that goes. And ever since Charles and Nick talked me into joining, didn't really talk me into, they're like, dude, we want you a part of this. So I was like, okay. So I joined Harness with them. And ever since then, I've just fell more in love with the outdoors each and every year. Awesome, man. So th- thank you, guys. That's kind of a little bit about them. Obviously, you guys have heard a whole spiel about Nick and I. Since I didn't really want to, you know, do it. So let's let's just get some repetitive stuff going on. Um, but definitely wanted to get you guys to know Jameson and uh, Elaine a little bit more as they'll be more involved with the podcast here going forward. Um, so, all right, we're talking about beginning or hunting 101 for beginners, right? Uh, hunting, some would say the, the orange book, hunting for dummies. Um, and that's really all we're going to give you is just all of our, uh, four different opinions on what you, it could be anything from what you need, what you need to know to where you should start. Right. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. You guys have anything else before we kind of get rocking and rolling here? Uh, no, not at all, man. Just that this is kind of my passion. Like this is what I do for work is take people out for the first time. So Cause I was in the same boat and I started knowing absolutely nothing and really had to learn it from the ground up by myself and luckily with good people around me. So um, getting people excited about the sport is uh, is a huge passion of mine. So excited about this, 
this episode. We definitely hope we can bring you guys some uh, worthy content. And if there's anything that you guys have, like any recommendations that you all have, please let us know. We'll definitely work on getting those in. Um, Nick, let's go. Let's go you first. Just kind of give us a rundown on, hey, I'm beginning hunting. I'm, I'm just getting into it. What do I need? What do I need to know? Whatever, whatever you have for us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's kind of a – a broad topic, but I'll try to sum it up the best I personally can again for, uh, you know, my opinion, um, based off of what I think people really need to focus on to get going. Um, you know, obviously hunter safety is number one. There's so many different ways you can do it. Um, there's so many courses, especially through the summer, different places that host it. Um, there's a lot of ability to, meet people that way as well. New time, new hunters, as well as people that have been doing it for a while. You know, I took the course, um, more so for fun back in 2016 when a friend of mine was getting her hunter safety done finally. And it was just fun to be in that refresher course and, you know, be able to answer some questions that the the first time hunters really didn't know. But, um, yeah, I, that's essentially step one. And then, you know, obviously, if you've never been raised around guns or, or bows for that manner, you know, trying to pick out something that is going to be useful to you that you're going to be comfortable with. Um, my first rifle was a 30, 30 lever action Marlin. And then, um, Charles, actually, you talked me into getting the, the Weatherby of course. And that's pretty been no pretty way. much good. <laughs> Of course, Charles talking everyone into Weatherby. <laughs> yeah, what is that, all four of us here now? Yeah, I yeah, got I a Weatherby so. this year. <laughs> we got to get Ian on the train. Ian, Ian, I know. We gotta get that. Trust me. And, yeah, I mean, that's been my weapon of choice, and it's been amazing. Um, kicks like a mule, Charles will tell you. Even to this day, he gets behind that 300, and it's still a refresher course of, uh, of uh, how much padding helps. So, and then outside of that, really, it's just getting a basic understanding of your target species, whatever that may be. You know, Colorado has so many great species and game to go after. Um, You know, even if you didn't necessarily start on big game, I mean, the small game category, the upland bird, the waterfowl, there's just so many different options at different times of the year that really can broaden the spectrum of what we currently see is essentially all the hunting that we do. There's been a huge avenue for me opened up with Ryan showing me the waterfowl side of things, which I truly have never done before. I mean, when my dad and I was, you know, 20 plus years ago when I was real little, my dad would take me out to some fields um, in Eastern Colorado outside of Bennett. And, you know, I was more of the retrieve dog more than anything, but it was just a nice opportunity to get out and enjoy on some goose hunts. But then, like I said, Cookie really opened up my eyes to what waterfowl can bring. So you really just take the time, give yourself the best opportunity to learn whatever species you end up going for. Um, I don't necessarily recommend from the jump to do elk hunting. There's a lot of variables in elk hunting, as we all know, um, but also it just takes a different, a different drive for, for a lot of people. It's, it's, you know, not saying it can't be done off the road, not saying, you know, you don't have lucky opportunities. Um, you know, luck obviously plays a factor in, in life in general, but I would really direct people to look more into you know, potentially deer, or like I said, small game, turkey, things of that nature to kind of get your feet wet. Um, because no matter what, it's still, it's taking the life of something on this beautiful earth that we have. So you, yeah, you have to be mentally prepared. You know, it's, it was, it's always emotional. Everyone calls it a roller coaster. And I don't even think that truly describes it enough because the ups and downs are so unpredictable that you really have to hone in your mental capabilities when you step out into the woods. 
Um, you know, so essentially to sum it up again, it's hunter safety, weapon choice, species choice. And then we talk about it continuously over and over research. There is never enough research that you can do. You should always be learning something as much as possible before you even get to the, the point of taking your first step out in the mountains. Fully agree, man. Now, Nick, don't fool these people though, right? Um, hunting turkeys out west is damn near like hunting elk. I talked to a buddy and we're gonna go hunting this Sunday. And I was like, yeah, man, you realize we have a five and a half uh, mile hike and we're gonna gain 1700 vertical feet. No, um, I know, but so... you know, in the Midwest, <laughs> in the Midwest, you can get out to yeah. some gobblers and some, oh, yeah. and some relatively low land. I'm not saying it's completely flat. Yeah, if you're um, in Nebraska, but... Iowa, Kansas. Right, exactly. But you are correct, absolutely. In Colorado, the mountain turkeys they do things differently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, love I love it. It's an addiction. Oh, it is. Every aspect of it. Um, I, I guess I, Nick, is that all you had? Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, cool. Um, I, I guess I could go. I mean, obviously, guys, some of these things are going to overlap just because all our experience, you, you're going to have one or two things that, hey, you need X, Y, Z, and that everyone's going to agree on. So um, if it's repetitive, sorry. But, oh, well, you got, that's what you guys are listening for. Um, so I always said, like, go with someone on a hunt or watch hours and hours of hunting videos. So you can truly get a gist of what you're getting into. Nick kind of alluded to it, right? Um, you're taking something's life. It's, and if you hunt well enough and hard enough and enough, eventually it's going to culminate to you taking something's life. So make sure you're watching as many videos from everybody, every avenue. You know, you've got the hunting public, born and raised, hush. I mean, Dave Brinker, Elk 101, Randy Newberg, the list goes, Remy Warren, the list goes on and on and on. Meat Eater puts out stuff on Netflix too. Um, so just make sure you, you see that after you get the thought, oh man, I should be doing this. Definitely dive in prior to jumping off the diving board. Um, I have it on here also, get your hunter safety um, or education. One thing I'd recommend to all, you, all of you who are thinking about getting into hunting, Arizona, if you take their hunter education course, will actually give you a lifetime uh, preference point. Doesn't make sense not to. Um, the majority of the states, uh, any, hunter sa any Western states uh, hunter safety course is good with all, you know, nine, 10 states on the, um, in the West. Now, what I'd say about hunter safety is this doesn't teach you about hunting necessarily, but it gives you a step into survival techniques. Um, it'll teach you general safety around hunting, basics about what to look for after a harvest, before you shoot, um, as well as even an entry into uh, the type, the method of take, you know, the the bow or or the firearm that you're you're going to be using there's also if you're only a bow hunter you're like man i want to get after that art and also more tags available obviously um i would recommend there's a bow hunters education course that not many people know about um i think only five states offer it but that's a pretty unique thing kind of more tended towards um bow hunting so there's something to think about that. If you don't have any friends or like family that you're comfortable with that hunt, consider calling your local game and fish office uh, and asking them, hey, you know, I think one of the biggest things is taking care of the animal. There's yes, yes sir. nothing that irritates me more than when I see an animal being mishandled um, or I, I guess that's the wrong term, but just improperly disposed of. Or so I would processed. Say, or, or processed, yeah. I mean, because then you take it to the process, there's dog drive meat that it isn't necessary of being on there. And, and then they're like, well, we can't do anything with it, you know? Right. Um, so what's cool about this is that you can go to the local or the majority of your local game and fish offices if you're in Colorado, the CPW offices, 
and get a lot of their uh, like roadkill things. And Jameson, correct me if I'm wrong, because um, this is just something I overheard. But and, and you can even you know kind of if they have time, if it's not a busy season for them, walk walk you through literally. <laughs> or maybe you watch a video and then you're like, hey, I'm going to practice it on this road kill animal that otherwise is going to go to the trash because it got obliterated by a truck, you know. Um, so I feel like that's a huge, huge thing, especially repetition will keep it in your mind. So when you're mm -hmm. back there in the backwoods, 10, 15 miles, you'll know what to do and how to properly care for your animal. Jameson, is that correct? Yeah, Charles, you're 100% on that. Um, actually, I've done it for people before. Uh, so a couple of cool things that the uh, the state does here in Colorado, um, at least out west where I'm at, is uh, if people come in and we have animals that need to be taken care of, um, they can come in and watch, even get hands on. But uh, out west, we put on a gutting and skinning 101 class that uh, anybody can sign up for. And it's the same thing. Um, we collect roadkill um, over a week or two. Uh, we'll put them in the freezer and then when the class is coming up, um, take them out, kind of thaw them out and go to a, a big warehouse and have people kind of gather around and watch us gut, quarter, skin. Um, we even have... Uh, can guys jump from, in on that? Um, depends on how many people show up. If, gotcha. it's a, if it's a big group, probably not. Um, but if it's, yeah. you know a little bit smaller than people can definitely get in. But uh, we actually have a partnership with uh, backcountry hunters and anglers. Um, and one of their guys comes out every time and he'll actually take a quarter and break it all the way down processing wise. So taking your top rounds off, taking your bottom rounds off, showing you, you know, kind of the cuts of meat that you can pull from that. Um, so those are really cool opportunities to uh, get hands on or at least you know, involved with before uh, you're doing it for the first time. Cause all the people that I've ever taken um, hunting for their first time, it's, it's just that when the animal's actually on the ground and you're standing there next to it, it's a, uh, it's quite the hill to climb. Uh, and if you don't know what you're doing or you have a rough idea what you're doing and you've never done it before, it can be a very daunting task. And depending on what time of year it is, it's say it's, you know, early September, you know, your time is ticking quickly. Um, so like you were talking about the uh, proper handling of an animal and processing and everything, um, there's nothing worse than sitting there not knowing what you're doing. I mean, we've all seen, um, gosh, what's that movie where the, uh, the kid goes out in Alaska um, and shoots the moose and he had no idea what he was doing with it and lost all the meat. I don't know if you guys know what movie I'm talking about. Said we've all seen it. I cannot. <laughs> I yeah, no, the only no book idea. I can only book I can think of is Hatchet. Isn't it? Yeah, uh, Hatchet. The, that's what I was gonna say. Into the Wild or something. Oh, Into the Wild. That is what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's still one of the books I've read. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so exactly. You know, he he was all excited. You know, a kid was starving and. I mean, that's a lot of us now, right? We, you would get those wide eyes when an animal steps in front of us. And we're like, oh, boy, here's our opportunity, especially for a new hunter. And um, they end up taking it, taking its life, which, Nick, like you alluded to, is it's not an easy thing. No matter how many years you've hunted um, and how many animals you've put down, it's, it's not an easy thing ever. Um, and so then to do that animal, the disrespect of not actually being able to take it home and utilize it for what it is, is just devastating. So um, I totally agree with you guys getting very proficient in knife skills and um, maintenance of, of meat is paramount before you go out. Oh. Definitely. Um, so something else I have, know your weapon and shoot your weapon. Uh, Nick kind of said this as well. Again, some of these things are going to overlap. This is huge for me. Um, you should know, you know, I had a bow issue last year. I was shooting left on everything. And I could, I mean, some of the guys went to tack with me. They, they could tell you, I, I could decently calculate that because I knew where I was hitting. Um, you know, my rifle, it kicks like a mule, but I feel comfortable with that thing out to 700 yards. I mean, all day long. And that's 
seven hundreds when I've had to start to you know kind of gather things and think because I train for that. Uh, whenever I shoot my rifle, I think about things like that. I think about situations. I'll try to get the heart rate going and things like that. It's important to do that as often as you can. I live in Denver, so there's really no excuse to not. You know, go to a shooting range, and, and um, I, I personally like to go to the National Force if you can. I'm in a legal spot. But anyway, so know your weapon, shoot your weapon. It should be an extension of your hands, an extension of your body. Um, and then know before you go, right? Um, this is one of the Colorado bumper stickers that has been a bumper sticker since I have gotten to hunting at six years old. Um, from Onyx to Scout to Hunt – basic BLM maps, there's no reason that you should be hunting on private land. Um, if you, if you, unless you have a private land tag, then, Hey, call me, I'll send you my number. We'll figure it out. <laughs> um, but if you're hunting the public land, you know, tag, there really should be no reason that, that, that you're flirting with the, um, Oh man, am I on public? Am I on private? That, this 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 stuff is pretty satellite generated, and, and about pretty fa as flawless as you can be. Um, ethicality, right? So ethics, huge huge thing. I've been bit in the rear multiple times throughout my life from hunters being just straight up disrespectful to. One time, my family and I were watching the valley. There's four of us, two of us on each side of the valley. And these guys looked at us for about 10 minutes and walked right through the middle and was like, hey, boys, we're just going to push on past. And I was like, dog, come on. It's I, Hunter, and I get it. Maybe you had that spot planned. Maybe you had that spot picked. But if you're not like – it's kind of the old adage, you know, I got here first. I mean, it's just respect. And, and really, we have a bad name as hunters as it is because people think we're just, like, killing maniacs. If you add ethics to it, you would be shocked at the amount of people that you can change. It, that goes from even shopping at the in-city in gas station when you're hunting, saying, you know, treating the attendant or clerk like they're a person. I've seen countless times people from out of state don't even pay any attention to people. Don't say hi. Someone will hold the door, hold the door open. They won't say anything. Same thing applies in the field, man. If if you see someone there, hey, they were there first. Have a plan B. Have a plan C, and execute that way. Um, final thing I have <clears throat> is East Sky. Everything from Google Earth, you know, transfer that to KML files, and uh, transfer those to Onyx. Um, reach out to us if you have any questions. I know uh, Ian and myself are pretty proficient in the uh, Google Earth to KML to Onyx switching. Please reach out if you have any questions on any of this stuff. But ultimately, if you're looking for like rules and laws, reach out to your local Parks and Wildlife or Game and Fish office. That's all I have, guys. Well, I just wanted to say... Uh... Just to like hit the nail one more time on the head, like you guys said, it's going to be a little bit repetitive, but I think it's the utmost importance is the the respectful aspect of it. Yeah. That's kind of the one I have highlighted for this. And um, my kind of three topics are respect of an animal, which Charles um, definitely hit on pretty heavy there. Uh, I have respect for your fellow hunter. Once again, Charles hit on and respect for the law. Um, those three things to get you out into the woods is just going to make your time out there so much more enjoyable. Um, you're not going to have to worry, you're like looking over your shoulder, like, Oh, am I breaking the law? Am I flirting with this line too much? Or, Oh, did I piss those guys off down the road? Or, Oh man, like, am I going to get a ticket? Cause I wasted this animal. Um, knowing your guys' laws before you go out is paramount. Um, last year when we went to Utah, Man, I was scouring the the Utah brochure for months prior to the hunt, and then I even kept it with me the entire week that I was out there. I just didn't want there to be any reason that I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing. Um, respect for your fellow hunter, kind of like Charles was saying, you know, if there is somebody out there that maybe got to your spot before you, um, I mean, for me personally, 
I'd rather have you come up to me and have a conversation with me, you know, right. hopefully quietly, you know, don't come stomping up, but, you know, make yourself low and, you know, quiet, come up and be like, Hey, you know, um, this is where I was planning on hunting or, or I was going over there. What's your plan. And then maybe you guys can work together. Like you can stay out of each other's way. Um, you know, maybe that guy, he just wants to sit in glass and he only wants to shoot from there, but you want to go, you know, hike that mountain. Um, you guys can have that conversation and, um, kind of play off each other, hopefully in a, in a perfect world. Yeah. Sometimes there might be a guy out there that's just like pissed off that you even showed up, but you know, I think, um, realistically, that's a very low percentage of hunters out there. I think all of us on this podcast and probably a lot of people listening are more than well willing to have that conversation with you. Correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, the, uh, and then yeah, respect for the animal. I think we touched on that enough. Um, just make sure you know what you're doing, you know, with that animal, once you get it, um, I want to touch one more time on the ethics. Uh, like Charles was saying, know what an ethical shot is. Um, that goes from, you know, having a perfect broadside standing shot um, rather than an elk. You, you know, you've never shot your rifle outside of the range before. And the first elk you see is, you know, at 400 yards, but on a dead sprint. You know, that's not a, a shot for you or the animal. Um, knowing what's in front of and behind that animal, um, not accidentally hitting two animals when you take a shot, um, like Nick touched on no one identifying your animals, you know, Colorado, it's astounding the amount of time somebody shoots a moose thinking it was an elk or, <laughs> you know, shoots an elk thinking it was a deer, you know, cause some people are like, oh yeah, what uh, elevation do deer turn into elk, Tom, you know, <laughs> so just knowing those little things can, can really benefit you uh, when you get out there. Um, I guess a few other things that I have that are a little bit different than, I mean, I have scouting down, but Charles touched on that. Um, I want to talk about gear and ability. Um, so gear, first getting out, you don't have to start with, you know, a full blown set of, you know, Sitka or Kuyu gear. You don't have to go drop $2,000 on a Kafaru pack, you know, um, get you stuff. Buy gear. Right. You could buy screw gear. You have, you have family owned and operated and quality stuff. Um, you know, get the, get the, spend the money on the stuff that counts. And what I have is boots, backpack optics. Uh, if that's, if you're a rifle hunter, um, you know, bows a little bit different. Um, but get yourself a good pair of boots, something that's going to keep your feet dry, comfortable, and they're durable. Get yourself a backpack that can hold the gear that you need, um, and be able to pack out an elk. Um, we all know Lane's Lane story from the first time, the old Jan Sport. <laughs> oh, yeah. The old Jan Sport. Um, but like I said, you know, it, everything else, you know, if you have the money, cool. If you don't, it's not a big deal. Um, I mean, it's the age old thing, you know, you see the picture on the wall, it's, you know, the guy out there back in the fifties in a red plaid shirt and a pair of jeans and, you know, being just as successful hunting as, you know, or maybe more so than we are. <laughs> um, you don't need to go drop, you know, $10,000 on a setup of, you know, camo and, all the bells and whistles. If you're just looking to get out there and get started, you know, get the essentials and then you can start slowly acquiring stuff after that. One thing real quick, Jameson, then I just got yeah. this email at 624 at 645 currently. Um, so water purification, JMO hit on that. Um, before you do, I would say go to grail. And when you go to grail, they have great stuff that Jameson will talk about, but you can also use Adrenaline 20 to get 20% off on any of your grill purchases. Yeah, so outstanding. Those guys have been awesome. And, and they have a phenomenal product. Um, I'm sad that it's taken me this long to actually start utilizing. Um, I've tried the tablets before. I've had the, the pump system, um, both, you know, adequate, but the grill system is just, 
easy. It's convenient. It's effective. Uh, it does both purify and um, sanitize. So it, it's an all-in-one and it goes straight into your water bottle. You don't have to worry about keeping stuff sterile on the outside. Like one of my, my pump filter, you know, if, if the hose that goes into your water bottle touches the river that you're taking the water out, then it's contaminated and it's not supposed to work or they don't recommend you using it anymore. Um, the iodide tablets run out. I mean, these grail bottles uh, last for 300 gallons. Is that right? Um, th they say about 350 uses. 350 so, presses. Mean, that could okay. be, yeah, presses. Yeah, that could be different for everybody. Um, but yeah, I mean, ideally, even then, the cartridge is what, 30, 40 bu bucks? I mean, right. buy one, have a spare in your pack. They, they weigh nothing. Right. And that can be dropped right in on there in gear. Do you, I mean, it's, it's a hundred dollars, but it's also a water bottle. I mean, so if you take out a consideration, 80 bucks with the discount, 80 bucks with the discount. So, I mean, what you say, you spend what, 25, 30 bucks on a Nalgene water bottle anyway, um, that doesn't do anything. It just holds the water and you throw an extra 50 bucks that way. And now you have a water purification system that you can take anywhere, anytime. Um, I use it for the army. Actually, I just got back from training, last weekend and you guys would be appalled at the, uh, the water that they say is drinkable, um, you know, for us, <laughs> but I guess that's what they pay us big bucks for. Right. Um, yeah, I wish I would have had this last year when I spent 40 days in Mexico. I mean, I, it would have saved a lot of heartache trying to find every little water purification stand, uh, from small town to small town in between, but yeah, just having little essential pieces of gear like that. Um, can make a huge difference for you out there. Um, is there anything else you want to say about gear or anything like that, boys? Um, I kind of wanted to hit real quick, Jameson, or I wanted you to hit with the law. So I think about, you know, we've always been told maybe by an elder or a parent or a friend, um, hey, if you get pulled over, you know, these are the best things to do to, you know, just keep everything at bay. James, you have more um, experience because you worked for the CPW with, you know, game wardens and things like that. What are some to-dos and not to-dos? I mean, obviously, you have an unloaded gun when you're approaching them if, or if they're approaching you. But what, what are some – maybe go into a little bit more on the law there. Um, just in, like general hunting laws? If, if I'm a game warden, I'm coming up to you. What, what are some things you're talking oh, about? Oh, okay. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, if a game warden's coming up to you, they're obviously already going to ask you for your hunting license. So, you know, just be ready to, to talk with them. Um, you know, they're just doing their jobs out there. So there's no reason to, to get upset with them. They might be interrupting either a, your morning coffee, or, you know, maybe you were just getting ready to step out of the truck to go for your, your hike. And they're kind of delaying you a little bit, but you know, that's what they're out there doing. They're out there for the same reason we're out there, right. For conservation, they're trying to make um, the hunting world better for everybody and with us giving them the respect that that they deserve and kind of need it just makes everything go a long way so you know have your hunting license ready um, like Charles said you know make sure your your rifle there's no need to have a loaded rifle until you're ready to shoot an animal anyway so nobody yeah. should be walking through the woods with a with one in the chamber that's just way accidents happen and you know the odds are astronomical but they're still there for a, a malfunction to go on so we just can completely alleviate that with not having one in the chamber. Um, you know, if you were successful and you got something in the cooler, you know, just getting ready to show them that having your evidence of sex on the animal, having your tag filled out properly. Um, it's just little things like that, that, that make those interactions go smooth and yeah, every, everyone can be on their way before, you know, like they're honestly out there to help you guys to make your, um, make your hunting experience better and shoot. They are a wealth of knowledge. Uh, those guys, if you're getting checked, that's a warden that owns that area. If you haven't like harvested yet, you know, chat with them. You'd be like, Hey man, I've, I've been out here for a little while and it's, uh, it's been tough and they can be like, well, you know, I, uh, I know maybe there's a, there's a local herd of elk that always stay in this drainage, you know, a couple hills over, maybe go check that out. Um, they they know they, they've been there, they eat, sleep, breathe, they live in that area. They're always out there. Um, 
check them. I just talk to them. They're great. Most of them are really, all of them that I know are great dudes and girls. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Lane. Yeah. So what are some tips? Okay. So this is me coming from a guy who has very little hunting experience compared to the gentleman here. With that being said, Number one, like JMO touched on, the pack. <laughs> that was the Jan most, Sport. Heck yeah, that was the most brutal experience ever. I will tell you guys this much. Yes, I got my pack for fifty bucks on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, the guy had used it before on many elk hunts, and I was unaware of what a framed pack was. And was like, okay, sounds good. So we got out there, dropped my first elk. That was exhilarating. But it was the pack out that I realized that maybe I need to spend a little bit more than 50 bucks on Facebook Marketplace on a pack. Uh, With that being said, uh, you don't need to go out and drop to, to... 500 bucks but you do need to do your research and figure out kind of what a good framed pack is my biggest thing and i don't think any of the guys has really touched on this but me and charles can attest to this i was a know-it-all like i oh yeah i know more i i know this i know that but in reality i didn't know anything i was just hoping hoping and praying that i would get something and it was really when Charles was all like, dude, you need to ask for help. You need to know what's going on. And I was all like, you're right. So I started asking around, started getting input from Nick, Charles, uh, reaching out to JMO and Ian and all the guys there to kind of just get thought processes and understanding. Uh, big thing that Charles told me was, dude, you got to check out e-scouting, understand that. Um, and then talking with Nick about, Hey, you got to be ready to, you got to be willing to hike. You got to be willing to put the miles on the boots to be able to understand what's going on beforehand. And last year was kind of like along the lines of my first kind of non luck success. When I say non luck, my, a couple of years back, I told Charles knew about this and I posted it on the Instagram page a while back, but I came face to face with a bull elk and missed my shot um thank god because as the guys alluded to i didn't know what i was doing i was just hoping and praying and so like the guys said get out there learn and be willing to learn and be willing to understand that you don't know everything uh and when i allude to this year was my first time having success as i called in yes i called in a little spike but <laughs> That was the most exciting thing ever because I was actually calling something in to within range and granted not legal. So make sure you know what is legal and not legal when hunting. So I would have, if I was back up in uh, Wyoming, it was a legal bull, but down here in Colorado, it wasn't legal. So make sure if you know where you're hunting at, whether it be uh, anywhere on the Western States Make sure you know each of those states' laws because that's that's a big bugaboo that goes on, and you could end up losing your uh, license or be even paying a major fine. So, and for sure those of you listening out there that don't know, a spike is a, is a bull elk with just like basically two horns. You know, they're not split, they're not branched. Um, they're just two spikes coming out of their head. That's why they call them spikes. Yeah. So. Make sure you guys kind of know the law. Be willing to ask. Um, I know the guys here at Harnessed, um, Charles, JMO, Nick, Ian, Ryan, or Cookie as everybody calls him. <laughs> I'm going with the nicknames, but uh, ask them for help. And if, if I might know answer to a question, I'll let you know. But most of the time, be willing to ask the guys questions. They they know a lot. They have a wealth of knowledge. And if you aren't willing to tap the knowledge well, then you might need to take kind of a sit back. Like 
Jamo said, be willing to be willing to reach out to those game wardens. Uh, I know when we got my first elk, I was so new and green to the whole gutting and processing that they had to walk me through it. And I, I'll be the first to admit that I, ever since then, uh, Charles was all like, dude, you got to check out this, check out this video. So been watching YouTube videos on how to do it, um, to be able to make sure that everything was right. So check out videos, ask people for help, do your research, be willing to learn. And on top of that, make sure you have the right pack. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Lena, I wanted to ask you something also. Um, you ended up in a red Columbia jacket that time as well. What would you tell people when knowledge of gear comes into play? So actually I ended up in a red Columbia jacket, uh, an orange Columbia jacket because of that. I'm, I'm but, blind, by the way. Yeah. So <laughs> I was, in a, I, I was in a, I was in a orange Columbia jacket because <laughs> the jacket I had on over that, uh, was my sick camo and it got blood all over it. Uh, oh no. But, yeah, I know. Right. So <laughs> what, what, what I would recommend is, um, knowing kind of what it is having having a little extra layers on that was that was a brutal one for me is uh gear like jmo touched on you don't need to go out and buy like the expensive stuff but if you are looking for quality and warmth because if you haven't seen me i'm a i'm a bit of a as people call me i'm a bean pole so i'm tall and lanky so uh, we, we guys who don't have a lot of layers of insulation on us, we need the warmth. So, uh, I know Charles and Nick, um, and JMO touched on the skier, uh, equipment. That's great. Uh, don't end up like me where your first archery hunt, you went out and bought $30 camo at, uh, sportsman's warehouse, hoping that it'd work. Uh, so do your research beforehand on, on your equipment, ask about equipment, ask about, uh, just equipment, but like what you're wearing, because that was, my toes were cold as all be. And I went out, I did a lot of research on new boots. So I got some new insulated boots even, and made sure that they were going to keep my feet warm because that was my my toes were cold that that day and then uh also like gloves and that kind of stuff that's important uh so just if you're rifle hunting and you know it might might get down to that those colder temperatures uh feel free to uh get some gloves get the right equipment to stay warm otherwise you're going to be you're going to be up a creek without a paddle and you're going to be wishing and praying that you listen, listen to your buddy, Charles, telling you to make sure you do your research and buy warm clothes. Yeah, and absolutely, guys. Don't ever hesitate to reach out because I think Please. all of us have uh, slightly different setups um, and they all work for us in slightly different ways. Um, so there's there's plenty of options out there and we can all you know rave about the reason ours is the best but you know you just got to find out what works for you 100 percent agree um something I, I allude to everybody is we joke and laugh about these incidents now but think about how serious this stuff would be if lane was out there hunting by himself and to give you guys kind of a, an outer scope of what happened it was a beautiful morning, um, and maybe, I don't know, when we got to the elk, it was probably so 45, we, 50 degrees. Yeah, so when we were out, we got out, and it was, when we were driving away from camp, it was 25 degrees, and when we got to the spot, it was 32, and we started hiking up the hill, and you could feel the thermals, um, the heat heat rising off the ground there. Um and you could feel the heat start rising. So it was like, all right, this is, this is going to be a decent <laughs> warm day. And we got to it. At, it was, it was maybe 45 to 50 degrees. You're right there, Charles. 
Um, yeah, and so so think about by, being by yourself, and then within about twenty uh, minutes after we started taking care of the animal, uh, I mean, just a crap storm. Why out came in, and and so we joke about this stuff. You know, we joke about the backpack, right? But think about Lane being by himself in that situation with not the right jacket, not the right backpack, having to pack out an elk by itself make probably at least two trips, if not three or four. Oh, with that backpack, you're talking six trips, buddy. Oh, 100%. <laughs> that was going to be a – if I got something with that pack, we were, we were talking like I would have been I would have been crying for the next month and a half about my neck. <laughs> Had to get you airlifted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so um, that's really – Oh, I have. Do you guys have anything else? <clears throat> Nick, one final uh, thing. Yeah, go one for final it. thing that I wanted to uh, talk about as far as the ethics goes, because it's circling around on social media right now, and it's just something that we as hunters oh, can absolutely not stand for um, yeah, at all. You. I was hoping somebody we'll would bring stay. that up. Yeah, made me sick to my stomach, yeah, and no, I, I can't believe you know. I, uh, you know, obviously we have to stand on a side of conservation that for one benefits the animals, but for two, that is prioritizing to the hunters. Um, and you know, right now in the division of the world, we have to be, we do have to be very selective on the battles we choose to fight. However, this one in particular is one that all of us need to jump on the bandwagon and absolutely disgrace of a hunter and if you can even consider him that um obviously if you don't know what's going on a gentleman up in uh what was it daniel wyoming Wyoming? yep ran a wolf down on a snowmobile and then obviously tortured it in different fashions before killing it and parading it around town while it was still alive and that is something that is purely evil um yeah. absolutely atrocious behavior and no hunter in anywhere should stand for that no one should ever do that to an animal again we as hunters need to respect these animals the game that we chase more than anyone else um you know we're made out to be these evil monstrous human beings that are just out there to kill and unfortunately, in this situation, that is proven true by one person. By one. And it's, now everyone's going to think that about the every whole, single they run into. That old additive of one bad apple spoils the bunch holds yeah. true continuously. And yep. anyone that hasn't heard that story, you need to go read it for yourself. There's still an investigation process coming out. Hopefully, more information will be released down the road. But that is something, even though... We may not want wolves here in Colorado. They're here now, obviously. There's nothing we can do about it. I hope Colorado Parks and Wildlife, as well as our legislature legislature around the state, does a better management portfolio than some of the other states that have obviously tried to manage wolves um, or mismanage, depending on what you feel. Um, you know, I plan, if there's ever a possibility, I plan on definitely hunting wolves in my home state. That is something that I look forward to in the future. But never should anyone ever do that type of malicious, sick behavior to an animal of that caliber or any animal in general. That is just absolutely atrocious. Um, you know, so that's just one thing. And that goes into ethics. And, and honestly, that goes beyond ethics. That's just being yeah. a decent human being. Yes, and sir. so, um, you know, yeah, that's just one more thing that I definitely think we should touch on. Um, you know, again, it's, it's in the news right now. It's hot on social media and everyone's got an opinion, which is fine. You always can have your opinion, but as hunters, as conservationists, we need to, we need to pick a side of the fence that we stand on. And I think there's a petition going around right now to hold that gentleman accountable and i hope wyoming fishing game actually does because all that's come out so far is a little measly fine and honestly yeah, in my opinion that, yeah and in my opinion that's not enough no at all i would agree with you i'd stand behind you on that till death so yeah. i mean a, a little quick story around. yeah a little quick story kind of on the same thing of ethics you know i 
a couple years ago came across the biggest bull that I've ever seen personally while holding a bull tag in my hand. And it was the most wild experience of my life. Charles was there with me. Um, this bull did not move for three hours or so. Maybe longer than that. Dude. Maybe longer than that. And, you know, it, it, long story short, didn't end up getting him. Um, and, you know, I tell this story all the time. And, you know, I had I had a guy be like, so his vitals were covered by a tree when I finally made my way around to where I wanted to shoot him to where I got in like a comfortable range. His vitals were covered by a tree. And I was telling this story and I had a, a hunter that I met out in the field and he goes, Oh, why didn't you just shoot his front legs out? And then you could just go get him then. And I was like, dude, that is just so not the right answer. Like it's, it's behavior like that, that gives, you know, the sport a bad name that gives us a bad name that, that is just devastating to the creature itself. There's just no room for that. So if there's one takeaway from this and one who's listening is just be a good person, be a respectful hunter, be a respectful um, steward to the land and to the con- conservation, you know, respect the people that are around you, the law enforcement, your fellow hunter, um, even the people that don't agree with hunting, you know, you can respect their, um, their choices, but, don't let it sway your, your passion. Yeah. I have a backbone. Times. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I tell mm-hmm. people oftentimes, man, no one loves wildlife more than proper ethical, legal hunters and anglers. I couldn't um, agree with you more on that. I mean, all the time. Oh, you guys, make alluded to it. You've alluded to it. I think Lane might have, you guys are maniacal killers. And in, in actuality, that's the exact opposite. You know, we know where our meat comes from. We know how that animal is taken care of prior. Yeah, and I've cried every time I've killed an animal. Oh, seriously, it's, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a it's a yeah. spiritual thing. I mean, it doesn't matter how many you kill, um, especially big game. You, you go up to those things and you're like, "Wow, you know, I, I, I took a life." Yeah. I mean, it's it's crucial to. Just remember that and act on it. I kind of, I've kind of talked about that before. Get involved with HAL, HAL.org. Get involved with the CRWM if you're in Colorado. The Coloradans responsible for wildlife management. Dan and his team do amazing work. Everett and John with uh, HAL and Logan, they do fantastic stuff. Just get involved. Derek Wolf's doing some good things any way you can get involved because we are fighting an uphill battle and these clowns, these idiots and imbeciles are not helping us at all. Like this wolf fella in uh, Daniel, Wyoming. Yep. Can I, can I say one thing on that? So, um, sorry, my dog decided to yawn there, but one of the biggest things that I've taken away out of hunting and listening to a bunch of a bunch of stuff in regards to it and um one thing that i think if it's i'm 100 percent, no i should say 80 percent alluded to in cam haynes's book endure uh being ethical and responsible and precise with your animals and i and I never told Charles, Nick, or anybody this, but I used to be, when I was in middle school, I used to be a guy that was all like, ooh, hunting's bad, hunting is unethical, and then when you really looked at it, if you don't, if you're not abusing the animal, and you're doing it in a precise and humane way, then it is, then it's ethical in my book, because you are helping alleviate, um, the pain that animal could suffer eventually later on in life. And I will always stand by the fact that I thought it was bad at first, but realizing now that I can be possibly taking an animal's pain away or in the regards to being ethical with it and not abusing the animal, it's 100% from my side, a decent kill if you do it right and quick. Yeah, fully agree, man. Um, so, guys, 
Does anyone have anything else? Though? This is going to be a great announcement. Hey, before yeah. you close out, there's just a lot of background noise. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say, you know, for everyone trying to get out and doing this, um, we touched on it right at the beginning, um, like outreach programs. Um, if this is something that you want to do, but you don't have a support network, uh, kind of like, you know, me when I was growing up, uh, I had nobody to take me out. Um, there's a lot of things in place for people like that. Um, look at whatever state you're at. Um, go to the, the DNR or the, the Fish and Wildlife or Parks and Wildlife or whatever it is, they might have a hunter's outreach program, which you could sign up for and maybe they take you out on a hunt or at least they take you through like a gutting and skinning 101. Maybe they take you out on, you know, how to track an animal, stuff like that. Um, if you are in Colorado, we have that exact program in place. Um, but there is also, uh, it's called Take a Friend Hunting um, and so this is for people who don't hunt that are looking for somebody to take them out. But also for those of you who do hunt, um, a little incentive program, um, you can win prizes through the state for taking a novice hunter out for their first time. There's some rules and regs to it, but um, there's programs like that all over the country. And then lastly, and I know Nick is huge on this, but uh, like Facebook groups, um, and Nick is a, a big player out there, just willing to help get people out there. Um, and I, Nick, I, you could probably touch on this more because I've personally never done it, but I know about them. You know, you can get on Facebook, on Instagram or whatever and find people in the area that you want to hunt and, you know, reach out. I mean, you could reach out to us here at Harness any day of the week um, and we will do anything in our power if we have the time and availability to help you get out there and get after it. So, I mean, I don't know if Nick, you know anything more on that but yeah i mean uh, sorry bro didn't mean to interrupt you no no Um, yeah go go the uh you definitely be ready for criticism um charles knows this best i charles is the best well yeah (laughs) (laughs) um i literally just offered pack out help i said anyone in the state that needs help in colorado let me know and i'll show up and You have to understand a bold statement like that comes with criticism. There's always trolls. There's always people that think, again, they know it all. They have everything set and blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, the number one comment I got, of course, was, oh, you just want people's honey holes. And, you know, whatever. They can think what they want. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, But there are absolutely, there's, you know, um, there's so many great groups on Facebook where people are awesome and they're willing to help out. You know, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, you do still need to be careful of the information you share because you are doing it on a public forum. um, Just be aware if you just simply tell someone, you know, oh, head out to Bone Bone Split Creek, which I don't even know if that's a real thing or not. If you tell people (laughs) that. Be ready for dude, Nick. Come on, you're giving away my my honey hole, dude. Come yeah, on. right. Exactly. Be <laughs> ready for the next hunting season or the next year for you to see a lot of orange or a lot of vehicles at the trailhead. I mean, there's ways to give people tips and tactics without simply sending them a waypoint on social media. Um, at the end of the day, we are all still held to our own responsibility. We should, again, all still be doing our own research and putting our own effort into it. We shouldn't be riding on the coattails of others just simply to get a cool harvest picture for social media. Um, you know, shed hunting especially has gotten very, very competitive and it's hard now to go into a spot without finding boot tracks even before the opener. Um, so, you know, you just need to be aware. I'm always willing to help and I have a specific way that I try to help people as far as, okay, what, what's the snow line look like? What does the feed look like on the South slopes? You know, different things like that as far as shed hunting is concerned. Um, So yeah, if, if there's anyone that has questions in regards to that, that has definitely been my forte the last few years and I've enjoyed it. And um, no matter what, I want people to get out and, take part in the woods. Um, that's the only way we're going to keep these things for ourselves rather than them slowly get taken away from us. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you team for joining on. 
Um, if no one has anything else, I'll just leave it to start about the background noise. We didn't do this smart. This is all learning experience. And get after it. Turkeys are gobbling, gobble back. Under Once chickens. Again, don't forget about uh, Grail purification systems and uh, check out Scree Camo. Bang, bang. Check 50. All right, guys. Have a good one. Awesome, right. guys. All right. And a friendly reminder, go ahead and check us out on Instagram at Harness Adrenaline and or our website at www.harnessadrenaline.com. That might help. Thank